Hello there. So I'm going to talk about faster websites with web components. And first off, like, who am I? Yeah, I'm already got introduced. I'm Thomas. I love the web and do a lot of open source. And by day, I work at ING. And we'll have a little table of content, like what we'll go over today. It's like, first, we'll set the scene, like, what are we talking about here? Then we will enter the era of components, so what they are and why they are. And then we will see if we have reached the promised land, like do we have everything now? But spoiler alert, we need to fix it. That will lead us then a little bit into the world of hydration and islands. And in the end, we will have a quick look beyond. So let's start by setting the scene. So we will talk about content websites. And for that, we need to clarify what a content website is. So first off, a content website needs content. Like, that's actually the thing that people want to read. And on content websites, you usually have little interaction. Like, the reading the content is the main service. And navigation happens via links. So when you go to a new page, you click on a menu somewhere. Like, it actually means there's a new HTML file or a new uh, HTTP request. Here are some examples of content websites. So maybe you have some information, like a company website or, or a hobby website. You could have some documentation for APIs, for libraries, frameworks, for tools, maybe like a newspaper or like a blog. Or you can have like a shop. Even a shop is mostly static, like with some uh, dynamic parts. And usually, with, for most websites, you have like a combination of all of these. So maybe you have a lot of information, a little bit of documentation, maybe you have a new section on your page, and then a simple uh, shop integration. And technically, there are sort of like two ways to do it. And one is like the MPA style. That is sort of like the classical way of uh, shipping HTML. And that's on the server, you have a lot of HTML sites, uh, HTML files. And then you organize them based on a folder structure, and then this folder structure just gets served by the server. And this is a little bit different to the SPA style, that single page application, where you usually only have like one HTML file, and then all the other parts are dynamically loaded uh, using JavaScript. And you take the, uh, the, the first index HTML is basically taking over the full routing of the whole website. And to sort of get this out of the way, like uh, MPA versus SPAs, both can produce amazing sites, so there's no need to battle. Uh, MPAs are usually a little bit easier to get right, uh, especially when you look at the performance uh, characteristics, uh, because with an MPA, you can have a new chance whenever you go to a, a new page, like you have a new chance of getting the performance correct. So like if you have one page that's like totally slow, like other pages are not affected at all. Or with an SPA, depending on how it's implemented, it could have an effect. But SPAs are like the king when it comes to high interactivity. So like if you want to build something like Figma, that's the only way. And also SPAs can give you this uh, app feeling that you sort of, if you want to compete with a native app, like an, an SPA is the way to go for now. Because there's uh, something in the work called the Shared Element Transition API, and that will hopefully also enable this smooth transitions between multiple HTML files, uh, even if they are separate requests. And let's start building it. And we call it like 90s style. We will do it like really old school. So we just make a new folder. We put an index HTML file in there. And it looks something like this. So really, um, just some doc type and HTML. You put some body tag in there. And in the body, you have the actual content. And in, in there, we have a link that just goes to a different HTML file. So then we create this HTML file as well. And we add then some styles and JavaScript as needed, as much as we want. And this is our site. And all we need to do like, to get this live is drop it somewhere, drop it on the server. This is like from Netlify. And all you need to do is like, take this folder, put it up. No processing, no anything. And it will be a live site that you can deploy and use. And this is basically how the web started, how the web worked from the beginning. It has HTML that provides the basic structure. And on top of that, you apply CSS to enable you to yeah, control the presentation, like in the formatting. 
And then you have like JavaScript. And JavaScript enables you to yeah, do different behaviors that are not baked into HTML and the browser itself. And then we enter the era of components. So with components, we could sort of like start with a wish list. What should components do? They should, of course, work in the browser and ideally just the source directly. They should um, uh, make maintainability like, really good. They should uh, instantly render. There should be no side effects, especially with CSS. And they should be configurable. And let's start with HTML components. Let's have this very simple example where we have like a header and then some buttons and a, and a number. And we could say like that this part, this enclosure, this could be seen as a component. And it could look something like this, where you have these parts, like the, these are the actual component. And as you can see, they're like in two separate places, and it's a lot of things you need to put into. So I would consider them more like conceptual components, because they are, you need to do a lot of stuff yourself. And they usually start with having a wrapper diff where you just apply a class. And then you as a user, you need to put all the HTML yourself. And the same goes through for like styles and JavaScript if the component needs it. So some components might not need uh, JavaScript and you don't need to put it. And here's like the CSS file for that. And as you can see, like it, there's sort of like this convention that you need to start with the actual component name that you put, which is like counter. But if you by accident put something else in there, you could have affected other parts of your application. And the same goes for JavaScript. Like the JavaScript runs in the global context, so you need to sort of like first select your DOM node that you want to like put the logic on. So how we're doing on our wish list? So the source works in the browser. That's simple, like it's just HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Maintainability is, I think, not that great, because if the HTML structure changes, you need to change it in a lot of places. We get instant rendering, because like CSS loading is like render blocking. Uh, we do have side effects. If you put the wrong stuff in your CSS file, then boo-hoo. And configurable, mm, I would say everyone can basically do whatever in their HTML. So you can place everything, but I would not say that that's configurable. But let's compare this with a React component. So here, we're just having import of the, the, the counter, and we put it in our app. So it's like a single class, function, tag, whatever you want to use to, uh, to create this counter. And that could be an example how it could look like. And I'm here actually reusing the exact same counter CSS, so it could have the same side effects as well. So if you want to like, have scoping, you probably want to introduce something like uh, uh, CSS and JS to uh, make this more scoped. So how are we doing on the wish list? Like the source works, not really, because you need to compile the JSX out. You can do this in the browser, but then you need to ship an extra runtime. Maintainability is like way better. You have just this single tag that you need to place in there. We don't get instant rendering, because you first need to like ship the JavaScript before you can actually see the component rendered. And no side effects, you can enable it, but you need to like actually take action to make it possible. But it's really configurable, like you have a nice API, you can yeah, put props on it, and that will be your public API. And now let's compare it with web components. So web components, like we heard before, like the exact same as a browser tag, so it's the exact same API. So that means like we have attributes and properties that go in, and we have like slots that can also go in, and we have events that go out. And as a user, what you need to do in order to use such a component, you basically just put the tag on HTML, and it's there. And in order to make sure that it's sort of like that the browser knows what he should put in there, you need to load the code for it. And that's a single uh, script tag that you need to put in there. So like just two lines, and you get the same functionality. But now what, will, what is in this my counter file? Like how do you define it? And you start by extending HTML element, and then you need to sort of connect the actual tag name with your class. And that is with custom elements defined. And if we look at a little more into detail what we will write in there, we see the first thing that's probably unfamiliar is like attach shadow. 
and that means we're now creating the Shadow DOM that was explained already uh, multiple times, but I will go really quickly over it because I think this is one of the core parts that we need to know. So a Shadow DOM, the thing is that the browser always had it. Like if we look at the video tag, I think it's the best example for a Shadow DOM, it's always there. It uses it. It enables really full CSS encapsulation, like you cannot escape it, and it separates the DOM from, into light and Shadow DOM. So here's like the video example. So this is basically, uh, I think you probably are all familiar with this, like you put a video tag, you put the source, and this will display the video for you with some controls. And it always felt a little bit like magic, like how can one tag do so much? And the answer is like that it really is more than just one tag. You, you have here this video tag, and then we have our source tag all the way bottom, uh, at, the, at the bottom. And then all this in between, this is the, like the user agent shadow root. And as you can see, there is like a lot of HTML that actually powers the internals of the video tag. And with Shadow DOM, you can build this, you can use the same technology to make your components. And this offers the true full CSS encapsulation. So I can have this example here. So if I have a style tag with an H1, and then an H1 that is in the body, and then I have a diff, and inside of this diff, I have another style that changes the background uh, to a different color, and another uh, H1, what will be the outcome? And if we sort of like follow the logical top to bottom rule of uh, CSS, basically H1 will get the hot pink color, and it will apply to all H1s. And now what we're doing as different, so to say, is like all we do, we introduce a shadow root here. So like we have the same diff, but now instead of like rendering the DOM into the same main DOM, we're rendering the DOM into the shadow, shadow root of this diff. And now it changes, because now the H1 selection only applies to its own shadow DOM and not the rest of the page. So now we finally have our shadow DOM. Now we want to put something into our shadow DOM. And we do this with a shadow root uh, append child, and then we clone a template. And what's in this template? Here, it's just some sort of like text that we want to put in there. And as we saw before, like we can actually now use very simple CSS selectors in our HTML, in our CSS to like map to the, to the HTML. So it's like enables you to make simpler, smaller components and like do not need to worry about uh, yeah, side effects of CSS. And then we can go a step further and like this is sort of like then the, the data logic in the sense of that enables you to like actually press the buttons uh, and update the actual HTML. And then finally we need to register it with the actual tag name. So with that we have a component that works the same as all the other components that we created today and how we're doing. Like the source works in the browser as is, there is no, nothing you need to change. It's, I think, very maintainable because it's like, a, uh, uh, yeah, it's the same public API as all the other DOM nodes have. We still don't have instant rendering because you need to wait until it's, uh, yeah, until the JavaScript is loaded and executed. And with Shadow DOM, we get, we, yeah, we have no side effects because you can put whatever you want in your CSS and it will not affect outside of the component. And it's very configurable by using the DOM APIs. So why do we even use components? I think components are a very good mental model, at least for me personally. For me, it's a very natural way of thinking how I want to arrange an application or how I want to arrange a page. It also enables us to encapsulate co code really well, so we can keep all relevant code in the same location, and we can also test it in the same location, and because there are no side effects, like we can make sure that they are in a good state and we can maintain them. And with this, it will also enable us to like reuse code. So we can actually make a component that is used for other, by other people. Like it's, and all they need to know is about the public API. And that enables, for example, things like an API that we can do at complex API calls and we just need to know the DOM basics. So our components to promise land. And maybe, 
but there are consequences. Because now, what we basically did, we have components that render only on the client. So that means the HTML that we ship may be completely different to what the browser actually renders. So that has implications for SEO or also like for rendering. And we have the HTML and the components are completely separate. So like the initial HTML and the components are completely separate, which leads to the infamous white page or white section uh, experience that we all don't like. So first, the shipped HTML. So here, this is what we ship actually uh, as our request, as our response to our request. So we have our H1 and our my counter, really nice to write and really nice to ship, but the browser then actually renders something completely different. It creates a shadow root and it has more content inside of it. And this can lead to this white page section experience. So when we start the page, like it renders the HTML directly, we see the H1, but our component is nowhere to be seen because the content of the component only appears after JavaScript gets downloaded and executed. So what did we do with components? Basically, we enabled us to make our life easier, but the user experience actually got worse. So what we need to do is like we need to fix it. And the solution in this case is SSR server-side rendering. There's like this huge debate about like, is it on-demand server-side rendering that only can run in the cloud or on the server, or can it also run on the build? But in our case, we don't care. All we care is like we want to focus on what the SSR output is. So what is the actual HTML that we will ship to our users? And our goal is to like make sure that the shipped HTML is as closely as possible to the browser HTML that get actually executed. So how is this in React? I think in React, like, it's very nice because you basically can just render it. It's already fully declarative, and you have just HTML, and your stylings are sort of like global, so you can just ship it as is. For web components, it's a little complicated because what the hell is this? How can you have a shadow root and send shadow root with HTML? And for that, we actually needed a new spec, which is called DSD, declarative shadow DOM. And declarative shadow DOM means you can create a shadow root without needing JavaScript. That's currently Chromium only, but there's like a very small, simple polyfill available. And it's very straightforward because what it actually does, in order to introduce a shadow root, you create a template with shadow root open, and the content inside will then be turned into a shadow root on parse time. So when you send the above HTML to the browser, the browser will, while it parses from top to bottom the HTML, it will automatically convert this template tag into a shadow root and will attach the DOM nodes to the shadow root instead of the main DOM. So how can we make our component now using this? So in this case, we have our example. We can actually get rid of the uh, uh, JavaScript completely and then we add this template with a shadow root inside of our shipped HTML. And with this shipped HTML, now we have basically this is now our new response, and what we get is this. So what we forgot is that in the shadow DOM, like we also need to include all of our styles. So now we have a shadow DOM, and we need to have the styling shipped for each shadow DOM as well. And that is also true if you have multiple components. So each component, or each shadow root actually, needs to always have access to the full CSS and the full HTML that it will contain if you ship it with HTML. And for CSS, that could be a lot. But there's no need to worry because the transfer of HTML is usually compressed. And if you don't compress it, then please go now and enable it for your website because it saves a lot of data anyways. And because it's compressed, it will reduce, uh, it remove all the duplications. So that works perfectly fine. And uh, on top of that, browsers are really good at caching CSS text. So even if you have 100 components that use the same style tag, it will only parse the first time. And then for all the other times, it will like reuse the same parse output instance to put into the shutdown. So like there's no processing overhead if you ship it multiple times. So it's totally fine to do this. 
So now the question is, this is our component on its full glory, and how do we create this out of it? And I think for most of the part, it's okay, especially the styles, you can just take it as is, and most of the HTML as well. But how do you do this? Like, how do you get the value, and how, you can, how can you make sure that you later are able to update it? And for that, there are sort of like two ways. You could start a full or fake browser, or you could lay down some ground rules. And I can already hear some people screaming like, oh, it's too slow, oh, it's like too complex. And honestly, I fully agree. Like having a full browser rendering, especially if you want to do on-demand rendering, will be just too taxing and will take too much time. So we need to lay down some ground rules. And these rules are your HTML needs to be fully declarative. So that means we can use something like lit, where we are actually putting the, the actual state inside of the HTML, like you used with JSX. With this, we can enable source side rendering of this HTML. There can be no imperative creation of DOM nodes. So document create element is no longer allowed if you want to do server side rendering, if, if this DOM node needs to be part of this server side rendered output. You should not be, uh, use uh, browser APIs inside of side effects, so only start using browser APIs when you are actually then hydrated on the client, and there are some life cycles that are not called on the server side. And with this, we will be able to like rewrite the top part, and then we have a script like or a process, in this case, like I'm using lit SSR, that converts the top part into the bottom part so we can write a nice syntax and then it will be converted into something that's performant to ship. So with this, we get this output. And now when we try to click on it, nothing happens. So it's like, oh yeah, we, we removed the actual JavaScript, right? So no surprise. And that brings us into the era of hydration and islands. So on top of what we needed to do before, we need to do a little bit more. So I actually lied a little bit before. It's lit SSR outputs a little more. So instead of just shipping the HTML, it adds some metadata. So we have all this lit part uh, in there as, as HTML commands. And they allow lit to recognize which parts are dynam dynamic and which parts, which parts are static. And with that, it can yeah, get control of like where the, the, the value actually goes. And if I have that, I can then just load the, the actual class implementation as soon as I want to. And this will give me back the interactivity that I wanted to have. So now I can click again. And here's sort of like a little side conversion in the sense of like, once you load the JavaScript, you get the full interaction in the browser again. And that's one of the things I love about Web Components is like you can just use the browser default tools, like open it in the dev tools. Uh, you can find the component in the DOM, like there is no need to map it to something else. You can access the attributes and properties directly uh, in the console, like by referencing the DOM nodes with uh, zero, And you can debug uh, without source mobs uh, directly. So I think that's, I really like that exper experience. But now we want to build a site. And we have like an app header, like a, a menu, then a footer, and then like some main content with some movie information. So we have like, for this example, like seven components, and we ship, we want to ship server-side rendered HTML. And we want to ship the JavaScript of those seven components to make them interactive. So now we are shipping everything double. So we have basically this in our HTML, like we have a, we have a counter, counter example. And then we have in the JavaScript, we have the exact same information again. Hmm. Why? It's like a lot of double work. So in a lot of cases, we don't even need that. So in this our example, like maybe only user safe and maybe only the star rating only those two things are interactive. Like for all the other parts, we don't even need to have them interactive. So maybe just don't load or just don't touch the rest. Like, but how? Like how can we, how can the app or how can we decide what to load and what not? And that brings us to progressive hydration. And progressive hydrations is a little bit, I think, more the domain of frameworks. 
because now you basically need to manage the loading. So that means you as a user, you're no longer allowed, so to say, uh, to load your components in a way you want because you need to hand this over to the framework because it needs to then decide when to load it based on some conditions. And as far as I know, there are only two systems right now, like Ace, uh, Astro and, and Rocket that support this because like I'm doing a lot for Rocket. Uh, I will show the example for this. So what we're doing here, like we define the component and we say like this user save that we want to uh, make interactive again. We assign the tag name to the actual location and then we also uh, supply the actual class name. And with that information, Rocket can decide what to do. So here we now have our body and all of these uh, components, they, are full, they will be fully server rendered because there's no state whatsoever with them and only the user safe and also the uh, user uh, star rating, those will be loaded dynamically. And we will use, in this case, there are like multiple ways how, can, how you can do loading, but we will use hydrate on visible. So this component will only load when the, it becomes visible. So now, ta-da, we have a website. It's mostly static. We are only shipping the JavaScript for two components and the rest never never ends up on the client. We have great developer experience and great user experience. So how we're doing on our comparison slide. So the source, and I will now put this uh, together with React and uh, uh, Web Components together. Like if we use server-side rendering, we get the source no longer really works in the browser because we, in the source with the actual HTML is like a render target. So what we write is not what we actually ship. Uh, but we have still great maintainability. We get this instant render because now the initial HTML that you have directly renders without any JavaScript. We don't need to wait for a JavaScript to display the full page. Um, yeah, the side effect and didn't change and both are still super configurable. So that brings us a little bit into a, a look beyond. So islands and server side rendering, what does it mean or what could it mean? Like you can go crazy with components. Like everything visual should be a component in my opinion if you can use server-side rendering. Because if you have only styles, there will be zero runtime cost. It will only be a cost on the server. And I think that's the benefit of like having this component-sized thinking is well worth like doing this. So like take your cards, take your icons, take your headlines, whatever you choose, like make it a component and only use styles, then you have zero runtime cost. It enables you to have a, a simple, consistent developer experience for every component, so you don't need to choose between what is interactive and what is uh, uh, static. There could even be only server components, maybe components that grab stuff from the file system, like only execute them on the, on, on the server and then ship them just a static HTML and never touch them again. And the benefit of like using web components in this case is also like, even if you have no server-side rendering capabilities with your system or your service, you can still just then fall back to client rendering. So it's, it's, I think it's a good transition you can do. And also you get the SEO and performance benefits uh, doing this. And while we talk a little bit about performance, I wanna showcase a little how the React docs work. Um, so this is the page looks mostly static, and it is, and it starts off with just two kilobytes of main thread JavaScript. So two kilobytes that is purely like the hydration uh, loader system. And then it hydrates component as needed. So as soon as you click uh, on, the, on the search, for example, then it loads the search dropdown and it loads more JavaScript as needed. Because, um, and also because these are web components, these are maybe like four or five kilobytes that you then need to load. It's like really small. And on mobile, for example, like we have a drawer and that will also then load as needed. And the whole page works without any JavaScript uh, using declarative shutter DOM. So this page, I think uses like 15 or so components, but we ship basically nothing by default. And you can check it out at rocketmonoweb.dev if you're curious. And of course, because we're shipping almost zero JavaScript, like you get yeah, very good scores, performance, everything is perfect. Like it's interactive on, in 1.1 seconds on like a, a, on, a, on a mobile phone, on an old mobile phone. And with that, 
I want to sort of like end it with a, with a quote, like do more with less. I think it's a crucial principle to learn, especially if you're going to be in business in this rapidly changing world. So do less and let the sort of like on the client do more on the server. Thank you.